Good afternoon. We are here today to announce the results of the fourth phase of Operation North Star, a five-month initiative undertaken by the U.S. Marshals Service and law enforcement partners to target the most dangerous fugitives and violent offenders in 10 metropolitan areas across the country. Before we do, however, there are two matters I want to address. The first is a major law enforcement action the Justice Department has taken to counter some of the many threats Iran poses to our country. And the second is that we will soon mark one year since Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack on Israel. First, with regard to Iran, there are few actors in this world that pose as grave a threat to the national security of the United States as does Iran, a state sponsor of terrorism. Iran's malign activities are wide-ranging. The U.S. government is intensely tracking Iran's lethal plotting against current and former U.S. government officials, including former President Trump. We are working to investigate and disrupt Iran's funding and support of Hamas, Hezbollah, and other terrorist groups. And we are working relentlessly to uncover and counter Iran's efforts to stoke discord, to undermine confidence in our democratic institutions, and to influence our elections. As the intelligence community has reported, we are seeing increasingly aggressive Iranian cyber activity during this election cycle. In August, the intelligence community reported an ongoing effort by Iran to compromise former President Trump's campaign and to influence the U.S. election process. Last week, the intelligence community reported that in late June and early July, Iranian malicious cyber actors sent unsolicited emails to individuals who were then associated with President Biden's campaign. The emails contained an excerpt taken from stolen, non-public information from former President Trump's campaign as text in the emails. The intelligence community reported that there is currently no information indicating the recipients of the emails replied. The intelligence community further reported that Iranian malicious cyber actors have continued their efforts since June to send stolen, non-public material associated with former President Trump's campaign to U.S. media organizations. Moments ago, the Justice Department unsealed an indictment charging three hackers working for the Iranian government with material support for terrorism, computer fraud, wire fraud, and identity theft for their roles in these cyber attacks. The three hackers are Iranian nationals residing in Iran. As outlined in our indictment, the defendants, Masoud Jalili, Saeed Ali Agamiri, and Yasir Balagi, conspired with others to deploy a years-long, wide-ranging hacking operation on behalf of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC. The operation targeted the email accounts of current and former American public officials, journalists, and most recently, individuals associated with U.S. political campaigns. The defendants' own words make clear that they were attempting to undermine former President Trump's campaign in advance of the 2024 U.S. presidential election. We know that Iran is continuing its brazen efforts to stoke discord, erode confidence in the U.S. electoral process, and advance its malign activities to the IRGC, a designated foreign terrorist organization. The Justice Department is committed to countering the threat that Iran poses to our democracy, to our national security, and to our allies in the international community. As we approach the upcoming election, I want to reiterate that the Justice Department will not tolerate attempts by Iran or by any foreign power to interfere in our elections and undermine our democracy. Together with our partners across the federal government, we will use every tool we have to counter and disrupt the efforts of Iran, as well as Russia and China, to exploit our democratic system of government. The message of the U.S. government is clear. The American people, not a foreign power, decide the outcome of our country's elections. Not Iran and its malicious cyber activities, as laid bare in today's indictment. Not Russia and its efforts to spread disinformation and propaganda 
to secure its preferred outcome in the U.S. presidential election, as laid bare in the indictment and seizures announced earlier this month, and not China, which continues in its efforts to exert targeted influence at the federal, state, and local levels in furtherance of the PRC's agenda, as described in multiple previous indictments and the intelligence community's recent election security updates. These authoritarian regimes, which violate the human rights of their own citizens, do not get a say in our country's democratic process. The American people and the American people alone will decide the outcome of our country's elections. Now to the second matter. In just over a week, we will mark one year since Hamas's October 7th terrorist attack on Israel. On October 7th, 2023, Hamas terrorists murdered nearly 1,200 people, including more than 40 Americans and kidnapped hundreds of civilians. And they perpetrated the deadliest massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. We are committed to pursuing the terrorists responsible for murdering Americans and those who illegally provide them with material support for the rest of their lives. Earlier this month, the Justice Department unsealed charges against Yahya Sinwar and other senior leaders of Hamas for the October 7th attacks and for financing and directing a decades-long campaign to murder American citizens and endanger the security of the United States. Those charges are just one part of our effort to target every aspect of Hamas's operations. There will be more to come. In the wake of Hamas's October 7th attacks, we also saw a disturbing increase in the volume and frequency of threats here at home against Jewish, Muslim, Arab, and Palestinian communities. That is why last October I directed all of our U.S. Attorney's offices and all of our FBI field offices to meet with local law enforcement and community leaders to strengthen our response to threats of hate-fueled violence. And that is what we have continued to do in the year since. But we recognize that the ramifications of October 7th are still being felt in communities across the country. For the Jewish community, this has been a time of a renewed, deeply familiar sense of isolation and fear. And as we approach one year since the October 7th attacks, we do so at a time when Jews across the country will soon be observing the high holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. For Jews, this is a period of solemn reflection and prayer. It is a time to gather together to worship and to be in community with each other. It should not be a time of fear. The Justice Department has and will continue to aggressively investigate and prosecute acts and threats of violence fueled by anti-Semitism and by hatred of any kind. In recent months, the Department has brought charges, obtained plea agreements, and obtained sentences for more than 35 defendants for criminal acts motivated by anti-Semitic hate. This is in addition to the many charges brought by our state and local partners. That work will continue. No person and no community in this country should have to live in fear of hate-fueled violence. No faith community should have to fear that they will be attacked in their place of worship. The Justice Department has no higher priority than protecting the safety and civil rights of everyone in our country. Working to uphold that promise is our sacred responsibility. It is one we will never abandon. Protecting the safety of our people also includes combating violent crime, which is the topic of today's third announcement to which I will now turn. From May to September of this year, the U.S. Marshal Service worked with state and local law enforcement partners in 10 metropolitan areas to arrest more than 3,400 fugitives and violent offenders, including more than 200 wanted for homicide. They also seized more than 500 firearms, more than $500,000 in U.S. currency, and over 450 kilograms of illegal narcotics, including more than 550,000 pills of deadly fentanyl. 
The U.S. Marshals and their partners conducted this operation in Dallas-Fort Worth, Charleston, Baton Rouge, Little Rock, Phoenix, St. Louis, Birmingham, Winston-Salem, Dayton, and San Antonio. The arrests included a Louisiana, man, a Louisiana man wanted for domestic abuse, child endangerment, and home invasion. It included four people in Texas wanted for a drive-by shooting that injured multiple children. It included a gang member in Texas wanted for homicide. It included a Virginia man wanted for sexually assaulting a child. It included a Missouri man wanted for opening fire at a car meetup, shooting seven people and killing a 14-year-old. These cases represent only a small fraction of the extraordinary efforts that the U.S. Marshal, the US Marshal Service and its partners undertook during this operation. I am deeply grateful to every deputy U.S. Marshal, task force officer, investigator, and police officer who carried out these arrests. They did so at great risk to themselves. And I am grateful to U.S. Marshal Service Director Ron Davis for his leadership of the more than 5,500 public servants who have dedicated their careers to protecting their communities. This is now the fourth iteration of Operation North Star, which we first launched in 2022 to zero in on and apprehend the most dangerous fugitives and violent offenders. But this is the first iteration of Operation North Star since the devastating attack that took place during a U.S. Marshals Task Force operation in North Carolina earlier this spring. On that day, we lost Deputy U.S. Marshal Tommy Weeks, Task Force Officers Alden Elliott and Samuel Pelosi, and Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Officer Joshua Iyer. As we remember them, we are reminded of the enormous risks that Deputy U.S. Marshals and their partners encounter every day. We are also reminded of the extraordinary courage of the people who do this work and of their loved ones. We could not be more grateful for their sacrifices. Three and a half years ago, the Justice Department launched an ambitious strategy to combat the sharp spike in violent crime that had occurred during the pandemic. We focused our efforts on enhancing the most powerful tool we have, our partnerships with federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies and with the communities we all serve. And then we fortified those partnerships with substantial funding from our grant-making components and by bringing to bear new technological tools that allowed us to identify and focus on those actors most responsible for committing violent crimes and take them off of our streets. Today, we know that work is paying off. Statistics released by the FBI earlier this week show an historic drop in homicides nationwide and one of the lowest levels of violent crime in 50 years and recently released data from the Justice Department's Violent Crime Steering Committee indicates that this trend is continuing. A study of 88 cities shows that violent crime has continued to decline considerably in the first half of 2024 compared to the same time last year, including a further 16.9% decline in murder. Here in Washington, D.C., where we surged resources to target the individuals and organizations driving violent crime, we have seen a more than 30 percent decline in homicides so far this year compared to the same time last year. But we know that progress in many communities is still uneven and there is no acceptable level of violent crime. That is why the U.S. Marshal Service launched and continues to relaunch Operation North Star. And that is why the Justice Department will continue to use every resource we have in the fight against violent crime. Our commitment to combating violent crime is not about statistics. It is about saving lives. It is about community members and law enforcement officers who are still here to see their children grow up and to work toward fulfilling their dreams. The Justice Department will continue to work tirelessly to deploy our anti-violent crime strategy across our law enforcement agencies, 
prosecutor's offices, and grant-making components. We will work in close partnership with police and sheriff's departments and communities across the country to go after the recidivists and gangs that are responsible for the greatest violence. We will continue to deploy our technological and prosecutorial resources to identify and prosecute the principal drivers of gun violence. And we will continue to invest in the essential programs that allow law enforcement agencies to hire more officers, to build the public trust essential for public safety, and to support the evidence-based community violence intervention initiatives that save lives. We will not rest until all Americans feel safe in their communities. And now I would like to ask Marshal Service Director Davis to say a few words. Good afternoon and thank you for coming and thank you Mr. Attorney General. As the Attorney General mentioned, Operation North Star was an initiative that was, launch was launched in fiscal year of 2022 based on the core principles of the Attorney General's violent crime strategy. It is a data-driven uh, operation that focuses on the most violent in our communities and it requires significant collaboration and partnership with our state and local partners. For example, for this operation, we had over 500 local and state task force officers participating in it, representing from, coming from some 100 plus agencies for, to focus on those 10 cities. I won't go with the stats again, but I will tell you since we launched it, we have now focused on 30 cities that has resulted in over 10,000 apprehensions, including over 1,000 homicide suspects. And when we look at that number, I have to pause and really talk about the partnership with our state and local law enforcement. We cannot serve a thousand warrants unless our local and state partners are working with the community to actually solve a thousand homicides, obtain warrants for the judicial process, and then when they become fugitives and goes outside their jurisdiction, then we bring the resources and assets to help them track down and bring these fugitives to justice. So that's the part of the partnership that I think is critical when the Attorney General mentions um, the, the strategy to reduce violent crime. Also, and I want to thank the Attorney General for mentioning the four heroes that we lost on April 29th. Just to see how, just a stark reminder of how significant that tragedy is. The task force involved in that deadly incident on April 29th is the Carolinas Regional Fugitive Task Force. This same task force participated in this year's Operation North Star in North Charleston, Charleston, and Winston-Salem. And it shows you the resilience and the commitment of Deputy U.S. Marshals. Facing, in, in face of that significant tragedy in which we lost four heroes, they still continue to go out and serve the American people. And I think the success of this program, all of the initiatives, the Attorney General's uh, strategy requires the commitment, the courage, and the steadfast duty of all of our law enforcement ag ag agents, officers, deputies, uh, in investigators across the country, some 800,000. So as we celebrate this part, and we basically work with our communities to make them safer, we, sh we, sh we should do so with the full recognition that it comes at great risk it comes with a great challenge, and that the women and men who do this deserve our gratitude, our appreciation, and quite frankly, our respect. Thank you. Great question. Josh. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, uh, I have a question for you on Iran, and then I'd like to have a separate question for Mr. Davis. Um, on the Iran issue, you mentioned that uh, the intelligence community had assessed that none of the recipients of this information had replied that were associated with the Biden campaign. Are you confident that they didn't make any use of the information? And can you also just discuss with us the impact of the distrustful political climate we have in the country at the moment? Uh, how does that make it more difficult for the FBI or DOJ to get cooperation from political campaigns in this sort of an investigation? On the first question, I can only answer what's in the indictment, what the intelligence community has said. In light of the evidence we have, we see no indication that anyone replied. On the second question, my understanding is we had good cooperation uh, from the campaigns, uh, that the FBI had good co cooperation from the campaigns with respect to investigating this matter. Yeah, you have a question uh, for Ron? Yeah. Mr. Davis, I wanted to ask, the um, operation you announced today obviously requires a lot of manpower. Yes. Um, it's been more than two years now that the Marshal Service has been providing enhanced security for the justices of the Supreme Court as well as their spouses and their families. 
Uh, is that something you foresee the Marshal Service doing indefinitely? And what sort of burden does it place on the more routine day-to-day -day operations of the service? Yes, yeah, so our assistance to the Supreme Court will, st will stand as it is until the Supreme Court has the capacity to take it over, and I know they're working to do so. But as the Attorney General said, is we're not going to do anything that will compromise their safety. So if we have to stay there an indefinite amount of time, until that time, we will do so. But we are working very closely with the Supreme Court Marshal and the police as they work with Congress to make sure they have the resources necessary to take it over. And it, do, it, it does strain resources. Uh, we focused on 10 cities this year, and if you recall last year, we focused on 20. So based on uh, reducing budget for 24 and based on increasing demands on uh, our deputies with regards to not just the Supreme Court uh, justices, but also the entire judiciary, we had to reduce the amount of cities. So it does have an impact, yes. <laughs> Mr. Attorney General, thanks for having us. Um, on foreign interference, if I could, you said the Justice Department will do everything it can to counter foreign election interference. I'm just wondering, if a foreign government puts out disinformation on the eve of an election, whether it's a fake video designed to discredit a candidate or information that seeks to keep people away from the polls, how is the federal government going to alert the public about that? And who, which agency is responsible for doing that? Well, it's an all-government approach, and as you've seen, the intelligence community, and particularly the representatives, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, CISA, from um, uh, Department of Homeland Security and the FBI have been providing updates, which have gotten increasingly shorter between updates, and that will continue as we get closer to the election. Uh, in combination of our intelligence community and, and uh, the FBI and federal law enforcement, we are working round the clock to ensure that we get the quickest uh, information about such an attempt and that we are able to uh, alert the American public in as close to real time as possible. Here. Mr. Attorney General, again, thank you for having us. Question number one, given the aggression by Iran attempting or applying to assassinate former President Trump and others, uh, the increased cyber activity targeting campaigns, what specifically can the U.S. government do to deter uh, them from this activity? Uh, if you could be more specific on that, then I have a follow-up question as well. Yeah, so this is, again, I say an all-of-government uh, effort. Uh, 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 at the same time as I'm announcing the unsealing, uh, the Treasury Department is levying sanctions, uh, and the State Department is levying, um, uh, announcing what we call rewards for justice. Um, we will continue in this way. We will continue uh, between all the agencies of the government to in, uh, discover, uh, disrupt, uh, and deter this kind of activity. Last question. Um, is there any evidence, or what is your best assessment of how the Biden individuals associated with the Biden campaign, to piggyback on Josh's question, did they respond appropriately? Did they contact law enforcement? Did they respond appropriately to receiving this ill-gotten information? Well, I'm going to say again, my only information with respect to what was done is what I've already reported, that we have no evidence uh, uh, that anyone replied. As I said also before, uh, my understanding from the FBI is that we've had good cooperation from both campaigns in, dis in investigating the extent of this hack uh, and of ameliorating it. David. Two very quick questions, sir. The first, what's the level of frustration that these men are not here in the United States? And what is the likelihood you'll ever be able to get them? You announced those charges against Hamas a month ago. Some of them are dead. Others are overseas. What can the American people understand about that? Okay, so there, there's actually two. This one has to do with uh, these particular defendants. Hamas is a separate question. Uh, with respect to um, uh, these defendants and these kind of indictments, similar to the one we did uh, with respect to RT uh, uh, um, about two weeks ago, um, this, these kind of actions have several purposes. One, and maybe the most significant, is alerting the American people to these kinds of false personas, these kind of hacking operations, these kinds of production of propaganda so the American people can see what's out there on the internet and can evaluate it appropriately knowing um, that it's a foreign malign influence. Secondly, as I said, this is a all of government effort and so it includes sanctions and includes rewards for justice. And third, I think uh, as history has shown, uh, the Justice Department has a very long memory and we are going to pursue these people endlessly. That's, um, 
The latter is the same answer I gave with respect to Hamas um, when, when those announcements were made. Um, we have successfully pursued terrorists decade, decades later uh, for their activities. So from the Justice Department's point of view, which is the enforcement point of view, we will follow these people for the rest of their lives. Just, just a quick follow-up real quick. You've been uh, criticized by conservatives, uh, Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan in the House that says, uh, he says releasing the Ryan Ruth letter uh, on the criminal docket puts former President Trump in more danger. Um, can you respond to that? Look, as I've said, I found the, at the attack on, the two attacks on the former president are heinous. I'm grateful that he's safe. Our first job with respect to Ruth was ensuring that he be detained. And when you file a detention motion, the prosecutors have to make the most reasonable judgment they can about what evidence is necessary to ensure detention. That's their goal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.